Tomorrow, I'm off to Iceland. Now, I had planned to take my trusty Mavic Mini drone to get some soaring shots of exploding geysers, majestic waterfalls and soured ram's testicles, which I gather a bit of a thing in Iceland. But unfortunately, I flew my drone into a tree yesterday, so it's off being repaired. Luckily, I've just bought a DJI Pocket 2, which is one of the world's smallest gimbal cameras. The question is, how good is it as a travel camera? Before I head off to the airport, let's take a quick look at this thing. My gosh, look at that. That really is very small. No, it's not. It's tiny. I'll just switch it on. But it does nevertheless have a really pleasing weight to it. It feels very solidly made. Now, I'm not going to say much about the features of this Pocket 2 because, well, it's not an entirely new gadget and there are lots of in-depth reviews out there already. What I want to do is see how well I can capture holiday footage and whether it's worth having one of these when you've already got a very capable camera in your mobile phone. So I'm going to compare this thing with my iPhone 12 Pro Max here. Now the Pocket 2 has one 20mm lens, digitally zoomable to 40mm, which can face forward or backwards. It also has a one 1 1.7th of an inch sensor inside. The iPhone, on the other hand, has a slightly less wide-angle selfie lens and a 13, a 26 and a 65mm lens on the front. So the iPhone offers more flexibility composing a shot, whereas the Pocket 2 here should have better low-light performance. The other thing, of course, is that whilst the iPhone has image stabilisation to keep the picture steady and iron out hand movements, the Pocket 2 is a gimbal camera, which means it can also do all sorts of other clever things, like hold the horizon dead level and make nice smooth pans, making for more cinematic footage. One other difference, which might be more important than you'd think, is that mobile phones are not what you would call a triumph of ergonomic design. They're nothing like as nice to hold as a 1970s General Post Office Model 746. And as cameras, well, they're pretty bloody fiddly. They're too thin. There's nothing to hold on to properly. And just how many times have you taken a photo of your left index finger? I've got a whole album full of them. Now you can buy yourself a handle like this one from a company called ShoulderPod. And that's great if you're just out filming and not doing anything else. But otherwise, this is not going to slip into your pocket very easily. No such problem for the aptly named Pocket 2. It's much easier to hold and there's no way your index finger is going to make an accidental appearance. And when you want to put it away, it just pops into its case like so and slips into your pocket. Now, I've also bought a few accessories, namely some filters and also a wireless control module, which allows you to control the Pocket 2 from an iPhone without a cable, which is handy if it's on a tripod. But talking of tripods, uh, bizarrely, this thing was designed without any way of attaching it to one. So I've also bought an adapter for that too. Also, it turns out that the joystick you use to control the direction of the camera on this thing clicks audibly when you use it. And that's not something you want on your film. So I've also bought a pocket control wheel, uh, which should do the job a bit better. And lastly, because my drone is now on its way to a hospital in the Netherlands, I'm also going to take my trusty iFootage Cobra monopod, which is basically a super light stick that I can attach the camera to, which extends to nearly two meters. So if I hold it above my head, I should be able to get some footage equivalent to a low flying drone. So let's head off to Iceland. Three hours later, we arrived at Keflavik, where we stepped out of the terminal building and there's nothing, literally nothing to see here. My first thought was, crikey, I wouldn't want to work for the Iceland Tourist Board. 
Anyway, first stop, Reykjavik. Thankfully, Reykjavik turned out to be a charming city which should definitely be on your bucket list, especially if you've got a thing about gaily coloured corrugated iron. In fact, colour really abounds in this city, but I guess you'd get out a can of bright paint if you live somewhere that only gets four hours daylight in the winter. Now all of the footage so far was filmed on the DJI Pocket 2, and I haven't adjusted the image at all. It's as it came out of the camera. Later on, I'll show you how it compares to the iPhone 12 Pro Max. If colourful buildings aren't your thing, there's always the Icelandic Penis Museum, or more niche still, the Museum of Icelandic Punk. And if you've got no plans, then there's always Hot Sheep Tickets, which is an activity I thought you only found in Australia. So that was a nice surprise. Then we got back in the car and headed off to the Gulf Foss Falls, whilst en route having the chance to spend another hour and a half looking at miles and miles of... uh... nothing. But it was worth it. Here are the falls through the lens of the Pocket 2. And then the iPhone with its slightly longer lens. Next we headed off to see some geezers, filming which turned out to be the geothermal equivalent of playing whack-a-mole. Every time you position yourself next to a geezer, camera at the ready, waiting for it to go off, another one will go off 500 yards up the hill. Same thing happens if you turn away to talk to someone. On the way back, we came across this weird moss-covered landscape, again first with the iPhone, then with the shorter lens on the Pocket 2. Then it was on to the Thingvellir National Park to see where the Eurasian and the North American tectonic plates meet. A little further along this crack in the earth's crust, we came across this beautiful waterfall. The iPhone gave it a slightly unnatural blue cast, whereas I think the Pocket 2 was a little bit truer to life. Then we headed off to the Blue Lagoon Hot Spring. With the water at between 37 to 40 degrees Celsius, it's essentially the world's largest hot tub. So this is a selfie in the uh, Blue Lagoon and there is absolutely no way I would be shooting this with a mobile phone. In the middle of the pool, there's a face mask bar. Now if you'd asked me before I came to Iceland whether I'd like to buy a ticket to join a hundred strangers in a hot tub full of their exfoliations, I'm not sure I'd have chewed your arm off. But hey, I'm here now. So what do we do with this stuff? So you just scrub it on your face and then rinse God, do it Do I off. have to? Yes. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Looking <Okay>. good. <laughs> How long do we leave it on for? About three days? Yeah, three days. Thankfully, we were on our way a little bit sooner than that. And next we went to visit the lava tunnel so I could put these cameras through their paces in low light. Now, typically small gimbal cameras and iPhones have terribly small sensors inside them. So they're really bad in low light conditions. I'm now heading into the lava cave and we'll find out which one does best. One thing I noticed is that while the iPhone is slightly better at reducing the bobbing up and down you get when you film whilst walking, the DJI Pocket 2 is streets ahead at smoothing out the bigger movements when you're crossing more uneven ground. Look, the DJI is almost cinematic here, whilst the iPhone, on the other hand, is all over the shop. As for low light performance, the Pocket 2 was well ahead. Here, holding the two cameras side by side, you can see the DJI is capturing much more detail and it's brighter. We emerged from the cave and <coughs> set off for the eastern side of the country, which meant driving for another five hours through vast expanses of nothingness, although this time at least broken with the odd majestic cliff, the largest lava field in Iceland and some more beautiful rivers and waterfalls. And then, finally, we arrived at the Foss Hotel to find... Ah... Uh, nothing! Literally, absolutely nothing at all! Honestly, if anyone ever tells you that they're in the middle of nowhere and they're not here, then they're not. A few miles away though, there were some things worth seeing. First, some icebergs which had carved from a nearby glacier. Then the famous Diamond Beach. 
So cool because as the icebergs float out to sea, some of the ice gets washed back up on the beach, shimmering like diamonds against the black volcanic sand. For the final test of these two cameras, we took them up a glacier, one with a reasonably difficult name to pronounce, much harder than our guides anyway. Hello Tensing. <laughs> Off we headed, and it was clear pretty quickly that as a glacier cam, the Pocket 2 was the clear winner, because you use it one-handed, whereas the iPhone needs both hands. And when you're crossing the ice, you need one of them to break your fall when you slip. Then we bumped into another party on their way down. It was starting to look a bit like Piccadilly Circus, or Everest on a busy afternoon. When are we going to start seeing spent oxygen cylinders? <laughs> Then, all of a sudden, things got serious. We'd reached a deep, deep crevasse which we had to traverse. I don't know if you've watched the film Touching the Void, but for a moment, I didn't know whether my family would be coming home in one piece. Whew. Thankfully, we made it through and stopped for a quick look at the top of the glacier before heading back down the mountain and off to the airport, though not before some last-minute puffin shopping for family and friends. So is the DJI Pocket 2 here worth buying when you've already got a perfectly serviceable iPhone? And whilst I'm here, is Iceland worth visiting? Well, the performance difference between these two cameras is actually quite small. Although the Pocket 2 is better in low light and its image stabilisation will make your footage look more cinematic. Surprisingly, I think it's also the more robust of the two cameras. I mean, you'd think this was quite a fragile thing, but actually it's not. I dropped mine a couple of times from quite a height onto reasonably hard surfaces steel and granite as it happens, and other than a little ding on the gimbal, it was absolutely fine. Drop your smartphone onto some granite and there's a pretty good chance you're going to crack the screen. But the really big difference between these two cameras is being able to film with one hand. When you're on holiday, a lot of the time you're going to want to film whilst walking, either because you don't want to get left behind or hold everyone else up, or just because some movement in your video makes it more interesting. Walking with both hands outstretched holding an iPhone is not great at the best of times. Doing it on uneven ground is asking for trouble. And of course your whole life is on your mobile phone these days and you really don't want to risk dropping it while you're on holiday. With the Pocket 2 on the other hand, I found myself reaching for it all the time. It didn't matter whether I was climbing a glacier, heading down a cave or sitting in a hot spring. Once it's out of its case, you just hold and operate it with one hand, leaving the other one free to break your fall when you trip over. For photographs, on the other hand, I always returned to the trusty iPhone. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, you always stop to take a photograph, which normally means you can use both hands. Secondly, the screen is just so much bigger on an iPhone, which makes it easier to compose your shot. As to the accessories, well, I bought the Wi-Fi module here so that I could use the iPhone as a viewfinder for the Pocket 2. But that then meant I needed two hands again, which rather defeats the object of the exercise. I also bought this Wi-Fi module because it acts as a stand for the camera. So you just shove it on the bottom like that. And then you can attach it to a tripod mount, which I bought. There we go. The problem was that when I attached it to my monopod, it just fell off, usually onto granite. Lastly, I bought the ND filters so that I could film at the more cinematic 24 frames per second in bright conditions. But they're very fiddly little things and when I next go on holiday, I probably won't bother. The one accessory I bought which really did make a lot of difference was the control wheel here on the back. It makes it so much easier to get nice, smooth panning shots. As to Iceland, it's a great country. I mean, barren, sure, 
But in between the miles of nothingness, there are some really extraordinary things to see. And if you avoid the fermented shark's meat and the soured ram's testicles, the food is great. And it's a real bucket list destination for soft toy collectors, particularly if you're looking to add to your puffin collection. So there we have it. I went a bit off piece with this review and it sort of turned into a travel program. I'm not sure whether that'll make it more interesting because geezers, waterfalls and stuffed puffins are all a lot more interesting than me, or less so because you came here wanting to see more close-ups of the pocket too. We'll see. Meantime, if you know anyone who likes travel or Iceland uh, or puffins, you might like to share this with them. Otherwise, till the next time, I've been Arlo Guthrie. Bye-bye.